And then whatever color this strand is, I have a sort of tensor product of that representation at the bottom. So we label endpoints by these irreducible four representations of our quantum group. And there's a construction for assigning a morphism of representations to a tangle. And basically what happens is you, you work out the elementary pieces. So like a crossing called the R matrix. You write down some very specific map of representations, which gives you that braiding. Every time you see like a cap and a cup, this is some specific map of representations. So you take these basic pieces and you build them together to build your tangle. And the miraculous thing is that at the end of the day, it doesn't depend on the planar projection, and you have a knot invariant. So what does this have to do with polynomials? You know, this sounds really sophisticated. Here we have irreducible representations and maps of representations. I thought these knot invariants were supposed to be polynomials. Well, if you have a closed knot like this, then at the bottom you have the tensor product of no representation. So that's just a trivial representation. And because our quantum group is defined over this uh, rational functions in Q, the tensor product of no representations, that's just the trivial, the ground field. So the knot is some very complicated map going from the ground field to the ground field. In other words, it's just an element in the ground field. And it's actually, as we saw in Tom's talk, it turns out that you don't even need all these coefficients. It turns out that these are all integrals. They land in these Laurent polynomials. And that Laurent polynomial is the invariant. So the famous ones, you know, when you take G to be the Lie algebra SL2, and you take the simplest defining representation of SL2, you get the Jones polynomial. If you take other representations, this is what people call the color Jones polynomial. And if you use SLN, and, and you can get some specializations of the homophony PT polynomial. So that's the story. Um, I'll point out a couple things that are hard. I mean, you really have to know about the representations of the Lie algebra that you're using and you have to cook up these explicit maps. You really need to study exactly like what are the intertwiners between these Lie algebras. The question you might ask too is what happened to pictures? You know, maybe you've seen a knot invariant defined where no one ever said anything about a quantum group and intertwiners between representations. They just show you some pictures and say that a, you know, a circle is equal to this, a crossing is equal to this. Take your knot, break it up into a bunch of pieces, and out pops the invariant. You know, what does this have to do with quantum groups? Well, you know, how did Kaufman get this construction? He was looking at you know, tensor product V tensor B, and he was breaking it up into, um, you know, he studied very carefully the intertwiners in this category and realized that there was a relation between the braiding map and the identity together with this cup cap pair. I'm, I'm going from right to left. Sorry, historically, are you sure? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. You're yeah. Right. Yeah. No, historically, he was he was looking. I was looking at um, Conway's uh, Conway's model for the Alexander the, polynomial with these single circle states. Oh. And uh, so he was there was, there was uh, some state model for the That's Conway it. polynomial, and then uh, they turned out to oh. generalize to a better polynomial by Conway's, and it turned turned out to be the correct. I see. Okay. Well, so he wasn't studying new QSL2 representation. Yeah. He also uh, used a different normalization. Not theory by destroying not completely by unknotting. Okay. Completely. Okay, so the historical reference to Kaufman will uh, omit that from the record. <laughs> uh, I guess nowadays, or if you're trying to explain to someone now, like, why does this relation hold, or like, where, where does this come from, I would tell them that this came by, this was a map from B tensor B to B tensor B, the R matrix. And when you decompose the R matrix in terms of other elements in the representation category, you discover this relation. So basically what happens is people study the representation categories of the quantum group and basically break down that representation category into certain generators and relations. So for SL2, the generators and relations look like these caps and cups. And it turns out that the R matrix, this braiding map, can be written in, the, in terms of the generators and relations via this formula. I'm sorry, you, uh, here you look at these pictures as linear operators actions from left to right, uh, not from bottom to top. I, I, yeah, my convention, that for, for reasons that will become apparent later, I'm reading from right to left in this picture. Right to left, okay. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, so again, I want to emphasize, like what happens here is that you really need to understand the representations of specific representations, specific braid maps, caps and cups. There's a lot of work involved in, in understanding these representations. 
So here's the sales pitch, and you can decide how interested you'll be in the rest of the lecture by, by seeing how interested you are in the initial investment on your part. So what will you need to know, or what will we go through in this talk? Um, definition of the quantum group SLN. Definition of the fundamental representations of SLN. So this is like you take the defining representation, the vector representation, and take its wedge powers, um, if we weren't talking about quantum group. And then this new guy, which or might be new to some of you, is this quantum vial group action. And this is basically, you know, when you study lead theory, the vial group acts on weight spaces. Or you, if you look at the weight spaces, you see that it has to be symmetric under this vial group action. This, when you quantize, the vial group gets quantized into a break group. And the key idea is that there's this very simple break group sitting here in, in the quantum group of SLN. And it's very, very general. So you have a formula that works very, very, very generally. And we're just going to make a big trick. What is this how duality? It's a big trick to where we could use this one braid group action to get all the braidings for our SLM theory. So that's the, that's the trick in the name of the game. So we don't need to compute R matrices. We don't need to study intertwiners. We're just going to need this stuff. And what we get is uh, an understanding of all the SLM link invariants and a way to invent this graphical definition of the SLN link invariance. So we'll invent the Kaufman bracket just from this information, not by studying R matrices and breaking it down into pieces, just from this data. Also, this MOI calculus, if you're familiar with the SLN, usually people use this graphical calculus, MOY. Um, this will also sort of fall out from fr for free from this kind of stuff. And I was talking with Matt Hogenkamp yesterday, and sort of helped me realize that maybe a better way to have sold this to you guys was if you're already familiar with the Moy calculus and that's something that goes like second nature, maybe I could tell you that you could now invent the quantum group or at least have a better understanding of what the quantum group is by going backwards from the Moy calculus to the quantum group at the end of the story. And then again, the advantage of this approach that I'm going to talk about is that it's, there's a direct roadmap for categorifying because all of these things in this list we know how to categorify. We know how to categorify the quantum group, we know how to categorify these representations, and we know how to categorify the bottle group. So we, this leads to a direct categorification of all the SLM link invariants, including their graphical description. Yeah, 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 I'll, I'll, yeah, exactly. I know I'm gonna get there in just a minute. Okay, so if you're willing to endure this initial investment, this is the output that you will get. So here's the quantum group. Again, if this is your first time seeing the quantum group, then you know, showing a bunch of generators and relations isn't going to make you feel like all of a sudden you really understand and appreciate it. But I'll just emphasize there's sort of two types of generators, or three types of generators, the Ks, the Es, and the Fs. And there's some relations. And when we look at finite dimensional representations, we just look at you know, a map from this into endomorphisms of some vector space. And the Ks, I don't use the Ks a whole lot because you can think of the Ks as being used to sort of chop up a, a big vector space into little vector spaces where there are eigenvalues for K. So when K acts on a vector V by some, I, some Q eigenvalue, then we say that V is in a lambda weight space. We call these in the direct sum lambda weight spaces. So what's K there? K is only there to take a big vector space, chop it up into little ones uh, that we call weight spaces where there are eigenvalues. And in that case, uh, a representation or finite dimensional representation of UQSL2, we just pick a bunch of vector spaces for each lambda in C. Maybe most of them are zero. This is, the, this is where K acts on V by some eigenvalue. We pick a bunch of linear maps, E's, and the E's move us two to the right. This is a consequence of this relation. If you look at what happens when you apply E and see what happens to the eigenvalue, it increases by two. Similarly, when you apply F, the eigenvalue is decreased by two. And the only interesting relation, yeah. Yeah, 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 everything's generic. I'm not, like, I'm just talking not theory today, so we won't, we won't do the genetic theory. Um, the only interesting relation, so this, if you're, if you're sort of zoning out, like, these are the only relations that are somehow interesting, is that when I start at a given weight space and I go E then F versus F then E, this is a bunch of copies of the identity on B namely uh, quantum lambda many copies, um, where quantum lambda is, is defined like this. Notice my conventions are a little different than Tom's again. He was using uh, 
uh, minus his q squared. Or he was using q to the one half. I'm using q. Okay. So here's a here's a different way of thinking about this. This, this we're kind of sliding more into the Lustig perspective of how to think about the quantum group. So. If K is really around just to chop up representations into eigenspaces, let's work with a, an object where this chopping up into pieces is more apparent. Now, those of you that have worked with quantum groups, you're going to object and say, well, not all the representations admit weight decompositions. But for the perspective of not theory, I, I'm not going to worry about those other representations. I only care about representations that decompose into weights. So we have to worry should be explicit. Explicit, yes. Yeah, that's me. Thanks. <laughs> so I want to define a category. It's called u dot, u dot SL2. And the objects are just the weights in SL2. The weights in SL2 are just these integers. The morphisms are composites of E's and F's. And I want this category to be so-called enriched in, uh, let me see what, let's see, uh, enriched over vector spaces, meaning I'm allowed to take formal, uh, linear combinations of these morphisms. So when I look at the space of maps between a given lambda and a given lambda prime, I get a vector space of possible maps between lambda and lambda prime. Just all the ways of composing these guys and, and, uh, and to, to, get, to get from one lambda to another lambda prime. And then the only interesting relation in this category, there's a relation on those maps which says that whenever I do EF on one lambda, minus the Fe, or however you read this, I get quantum lambda. And to write this in a sort of very positive way, like where this thing is always positive, when lambda is bigger than zero, I write it like this. When lambda is less than zero, I write it like this. And I probably could have included zero in both of these, because this would both be zero in that case. So they commute when lambda is zero. And you know, this relation should remind you of this relation, like when V was a weight vector in, in the lambda weight space, when I computed this difference, how does k act on the vector v in the, weight, in the lambda weight space? He acts by q to the lambda. So this relation is just a manifestation of this fact that we've already chopped everything up into weight spaces to begin with. So uh, what is a representation of this category? Well, it's just a functor from this category into vector spaces. Well, you know, what am I talking about? Representation is a functor? Well, think about what it does. For every weight lambda, the functor picks out a vector space, the lambda weight space. So that's just what happens in a representation, right? Every weight lambda gets assigned a vector space. OK. And for every morphism in USL2, we get a linear map between vector spaces. This is exactly what a representation is, right? The Lie algebra acts by endomorphisms of your vector space. And then functoriality ensures that all of the SL2 relations are going to hold between those endomorphisms. So this really is you know, your normal intuition about what a representation is. I've just expressed it in this more categorical way. And if you hate categories and don't want me to ever say that word, then you can just think of this as being an algebra with a whole bunch of idempotents, ones of lambda. So if I sum over all these lambda and lambda primes, this is a sort of, uh, we have a whole bunch of idempotents in an algebra. It's just taking the normal quantum group and replacing one by a bunch of idempotents, which are projectors onto the weight spaces lambda. So, you know, here's a here's our really nice example of a two-dimensional representation, or the two-dimensional representation of SL2. It's two dimensions, it has two vectors. One is in weight plus one, one is in weight minus one, so they differ by two. These what do these idempotents do? They just project onto a given weight space. So one sub one projects onto the one space. Minus one projects onto the minus one. F takes me from the plus one to the minus one weight space, and so on. And the, you can check that this guy really satisfies those SL2 relations. So here's a nice, simple representation of SL2. It's the, this is what we call the defining or two-dimensional representation. Um, there's an important structure, as I mentioned, like why do we like this quantum group so much? It's because we can tensor two representations together and get a new one. But how does the quantum group act on a tensor product of representations? It uses this part of this Hopf algebra structure, the co-multiplication. So this co-multiplication is E tensor K plus one tensor E. So if this K was one, this would be exactly like the co-multiplication in the enveloping algebra. 
it's a little bit boring. Uh, it's sort of what they call co-commutative. But with this K here, the K just screws things enough, up enough to where it's not co-commutative anymore. And that's related to why that braiding map kind of works. Um, so for example, if I started with the two-dimensional representation of SL2, and I wanted to act on a given vector, how do I act on it? Well, I first use the co-product to turn E into this sum. So I use the co-product and then each of these pieces act on each of the little vectors. But E acting on the V, that, that was zero, because he's already the highest guy, so he gets zero. E acting on V minus was V plus, so this, this is V plus tensor V plus. And there's another example here. If you're not familiar with how cool products work, this is just to kind of show you that that structure of the quantum group is really getting used to understand how to take two representations and produce a new one. Another construction, that basically I'm going to use exterior powers a lot. This is the only really part of the slide that's, that's relevant, is that um, we can also take representations and take their wedge or exterior uh, wedge powers or symmetric powers, where we just, these are just the sort of universal with being equipped with an alternating map. So I think of it as just being spanned by wedges of the old guys, where when you flip two, you get a minus sign. And again, how does V act on these symmetric or exterior powers? You just use the co-multiplication. And it doesn't matter how you use, you, you apply the co-multiplication a bunch of times to where you have enough guys to act on each tensor factor here. And it doesn't matter whether you do it you know, in one order or the other order because the axioms in the Hopf algebra say it, it doesn't matter. Any way you co-multiply up to get A factors in order to act on this guy, it's fine. So this is kind of just a silly example. Um, if I started with my two-dimensional representation of SL2, this one guy that has two, two-dimensional, and I took its second exterior power, so it's spanned by wedges of these guys. But V minus wedge V minus, if I, you know, that's equal to zero, because when I flip two factors, I get a minus sign. It says V minus wedge V minus equals minus V wedge. Wedge V minus plus. Anyways, we know that this is how wedge powers work, right? When you wedge two things in the same, you get a zero. And V minus wedge V plus, this is equal to minus V plus wedge V minus. So this, this, when I take the second exterior power, I just get a one-dimensional vector space. And what is it? Well, to figure out what it is, well, there's only one, so it's not that hard. But you just use the co-product again to act on these guys. So E kills this vector, F kills this vector, and K acts on it by eigenvalue Q to the zero. So I just have a single vector sitting in weight zero. E kills it, F kills it. It's kind of a boring. That's why we call it the trivial representation. And I'll just comment that once we pass the SLN, these which powers get a little more interesting. So you shouldn't think that they're always this, this boring. This is just trying to give you a little bit of an idea about how E's act by the co-product. You see the co-product here in this formula. Uh, for example, like why does E kill this vector? Well, E tends to be plus plus K. E kills V plus. And E on V minus is V plus, but V plus wedge V plus is zero. Okay, so now you learned about SL2 and some of its representations, how to tensor them, how to exterior power them. This is the last quantum group we need for this talk, is the quantum group of SLN. And basically, you just think about this graph here. Uh, that should be N, or that should be M. Let's just, <laughs> let's make that. <laughs> oh, jeez. You'll see why I have such a screwed up slide here because it went in a minute once. Uh, just for this slide, n equals m. <laughs> so you have n minus one of these little dots, and for every little dot, you have a generator, an e and an f. And now the objects of my category are more complicated because instead of just having a one tuple of integers, I have an m minus one tuple of integers. So what do these e i's and f i's do? they mess with the weights a little bit. So they mess with the ith weight by, so E increases the weight by two, and with his neighbors, he lowers them by one. This is just how, how these generators are gonna act on this lattice of uh, n minus one tuples. So the, in the ith spot, they either increase or decrease by two, they change the neighbors by plus or minus one. Modulo some relations. Um, to express the relations, it's convenient to introduce these divided powers. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, previous? Yes. So, alphas are two. Twos are what? 
Alpha i is actually an element in this uh, lattice. Ah, so it's, it's two on the i's place. Yeah. Okay. So so alpha i is is a, a two in the i's place yeah. and a minus one in the oh, neighboring okay. spots. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Unless it's on the edge, then you do the appropriate okay. thing. Just uh -huh. I see. So to express the relations, it's easy if we introduce these divided powers. These are just uh, quantum group generators to a certain power where we divide by some horrible quantum factorial. So the, this bracket, remember, means the quantum integer. The, the quantum integer. So when we say quantum factorial, that's a factorial. Uh, we just mean this product of all these things. These guys turn out to be really important because if you want to express this quantum group over the integers, the integrally, and we know, again, from Tong's talk that much of the theory of quantum groups works over the integers, you want to work with these divided powers. So they're somehow very nice guys to have around. And the only relations on this category are just our SL2 relations and some relations which tell you what happens when E's are next to each other. Remember we had that graph, the Dinkin graph of SLN? When the two guys are close to each other, they satisfy this relation. When they're far apart, they satisfy this relation. And when the E's and F's don't have the same color, they commute. So now you know the quantum group SLN, and you know quantum group SL2. OK, so that one more guy, this quantum vial group action. So when you learn about Lie theory, you learn about the vial group as something as some symmetries of the weight lattice. So when I take a representation and I chop it up into weight spaces, you learn that the dimension of a, of a given weight space has to be invariant under this vial group action. It has to stay the same. When you Q deform and pass to the quantum group, the vial group deforms to a braid group of type G. So in this case, SLN, it's just a normal braid group we all know and love. And in, and in fact, it actually acts on the representations. So before, it didn't really give us a map of representations. Now we really get a map on the representation. So here's my SL2 representation. And the quantum vial group, or the vial group for, for SL2 is just S2, just this simple symmetric group of size 2. That's just one generator that flips things. And we deform this to a braid group, B2. And what does it do? It actually just gives an isomorphism from the lambda weight space to the minus lambda weight space. So the quantum vial group is a trick for cooking up an isomorphism from this side of the representation to this side of the representation. And I can write down exactly what it is. B2 is great on three strands. On two. Just two strands. Yeah, just two strands. So here is a formula that tells you exactly what this L, how to write down this quantum bio group. This is the thing I was telling you. He's going to be the one that's going to generate all of our braidings in every link homology or every link, link invariant that we look at. It's just this one guy. So what is it doing? It's kind of like you start it here. And if I'm doing this formula, I first hop over, well, the first term, I don't do anything. I hop all the way over to here by applying F a bunch of times. Then what's the next term? I hop one to the right, and then I hop over here using Fs. Then I hop two to the right and come over here using Fs. Then three to the right and use Fs. Now, this is an infinite sum, so it's a really big element. <laughs> but on any finite dimensional representation, Eventually, we're going to run off the edge. We keep hopping over using the E's to the right. Eventually, we fall off the edge. So this is a finite sum. And we'll look at some examples of that. So this element is really going to be the key to everything that we do. So here's the beautiful idea. This is the idea of how to connect this braid group here to knot theory, to braiding representations in, in Reshetik and Triad invariants. We're going to look at a very special representation. So I'm going to take the nth exterior power of Cn tensor C2. And I'm trying to use two different colors here to help you like, keep it straight in your head. So this representation has a natural action of SLN, where I just act on these factors and think of this as just an extra vector space floating around in that way. He also has an action of SL2. So he has two actions, one of SLN, one of SL2. <laughs> And if I take this guy and I say, well, OK, it's an SL2 representation. I should be able to chop it up into these weight spaces, right? You know, that's what I said on the previous slide. Take a representation, chop it up into little pieces. Well, what is it as an SL2 representation? Well, let's write it like this. C2 was spanned by V minus and V plus. 
where V minus had weight uh, minus one, and this guy had weight plus one. So if I take this wedge power, there's this identity between wedge powers where I can break this up into a sum of applying the eighth wedge to the first factor and the beth wedge to a, the second factor. This is just how wedge products behave with respect to direct sums. So I have this big vector space, direct sum over A and B of wedge A CN, wedge B CN. And what's the SL2 weight? Well, this guy here has B, B pluses, and this guy here has A, B minuses. So what's the SL2 weight? It's just the difference of the B pluses and the B minuses. So this little piece of that direct sum as an SL2 representation has weight B minus A, okay? And the action of UQSL2, remember, E is a guy that increases the weight by 2, and F is a guy which decreases the weight by 2. So there's a very natural map, if you look at these exterior algebras, that goes from wedge A, wedge B, to A minus 1, B plus 1. Now when I take this difference between B plus 1 and A minus 1, I get that the weight has increased by 2, right? This minus that is B minus A plus 2. And similarly, there's a very natural map between exterior algebras going the other way. How so, do these maps are defined? Well, it's a little, I, 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 yeah, I have to get a little too much into the guts of this, but, okay. um, you, yeah, I, it's just a little too complicated for right now. Um, but you're taking a wedge of A guys and a wedge of B guys and trying to produce something like this. Um, what do you think? Uh, well, let me, I, I don't want to. Okay, let's we'll see. It, yeah. It turns out that you can skip it. This is more motivation at this point now. So just know there's some natural map here. If you, you could maybe you know invent it if you thought a little bit about it. So if I chop this big representation, this wedge power, up into a bunch of little guys, what does he look like? He looks like, I mean, like this. Each each S. I wrote in the SL2 weight down here at the bottom. And what does the quantum vial group guy do? He maps us from the nth weight space to the n to the minus n weight space. So that quantum vial group action is going to pop us from here to here, and it's going to be uh, satisfy the braiding relations, right? It's a braid group action from you know from here to here. So there's a generator and it's inverse, but it's not its own inverse. Now those that are familiar, here's where it would help if you actually were familiar with SLN representation theory, because when you study SLN representation theory, this vector space CN, this is what I was calling the vector representation. This is where you just, you know, SLN is traceless n by n matrices. That naturally acts on n dimensional vector columns. Um, of course, I'm using the quantum version of everything. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to not talk about the quantum group a little bit just to make it easier for the exposition. What are these wedge powers of CN? This should be to the A power. These are what people call the fundamental representations of SLN. And I just draw this picture to kind of help remind you. If, if one of these guys, the first dot over, this is SL3. This is like the first picture you see in a league theory class where you get past SL2. If this dot here represents the fundamental weight omega 1, this is the defining representation, then when I take the wedge power, I get this guy. So in general, for, for SLN, what are the... Um, these wedge powers are what people call the fundamental weights of SLN, the fundamental representations. And what is the skew, what is the quantum vial group action doing for us? It's actually generating a big map from V omega A tensor omega B to the other order. This, this, this quantum vial group action is, is actually braiding these representations for us. We never had to say anything about the R matrix, we just used that one generic formula that we had for the quantum vial group action. So the theorem of Kata's Kamatsu-Okata is that this map between representations is the R matrix. Like you're generating the R matrix between these representations just from this quantum bio group action. And you can actually understand caps and cups in this framework too. And the, again, I emphasize the key advantage of this approach is that there's a, it suggests a natural way to categorify it because we know how to categorify every element of what I just said. Yes? It's really the Q exterior power. Right. I'm doing everything non-Q okay. just to make it easier. Yeah, every, everything I'm saying is Q, and this is the quantum radius. Yeah. 
this is just a quick slide. Uh, it's going to make our pictures nicer if I, if I tell you. In general, I could replace SL2 by SLM. This is why I had so many N's and M's on the previous slide. So N is no longer equal to M's for this slide. If I take this guy, he's going to break up into a big sum where I have a bunch of different, I have M. If I break him up into an SLM representation, there's M of these. And uh, you know, it's just, it just breaks up into a bunch of these factors. So this is if you're trying to braid uh, M tensor products of SLN representations. So I have a bunch of different fundamental weights for SLN. I want to braid those guys, generate a real braid group action. Well, I need to use SLN here. So now I have M tensor factors. These are all irreducible SLN representations. And if you want to figure out what's the weight of this guy, you just take the differences. Like this minus that, this minus that. This is just like we did with SL2. We took B minus A. So this M minus 1 tuple that we obtained from this M tuple, that's the SLN, SLM weight. And you can define some, again, the same types of maps that increase the i and i plus first in the way that they're supposed to, so as to change the weights appropriately. And if you do it this way, you get the full break group action of UQSLN modules. So this is how you braid an M full tensor product of representations. You just replace this guy with 2 by n. Okay, so this was like, if I was not familiar with representation theory, I would be like falling asleep at this point. Like this is, this thing looks horrible. I mean, it's wedge powers, like it looks just looks crazy. But the point was that we could cook up some weird representation where the quantum vial group action became the braiding of our representations in Russia Tikkun Tribe. Let's get away from all this representation theory. I want pictures. I mean, I want to build the Kaufman bracket. I want to build SLN link homology theory. So I'm going to build this category, and he has a bunch of parameters, and these parameters are meant to remind you of the parameters on the previous slide. N, M, and the big size N. The objects of this new category are sequences, A1 through AM, where the values of these parameters are no bigger than N. So are they integers? They're integers, yes. And what you should think of, what you should think of is this. The A's, they can only go to N, because once they get bigger than N, this thing is zero. And how many of them do I have? I have M of them. So that's exactly what's happening in this. I have these M, these M tuples, where the values take any value between zero and N. And the sum of these values is N. That's exactly like here. The sum of these values is N. And the morphisms, I'll draw a picture, it's too hard to explain, we call ladder diagrams. There's certain very simple pictures that go between these weights. And composition is gluing them. So here's a picture of a ladder diagram. These will look familiar to you if you've seen the MOI calculus. So here on the right is my sequence of AIs. My AIs, in this case, um, well, are between 0 and 3. So the 3 here. They don't get any bigger than 3. And what do the ladder diagrams do? Just think about it. I've done, I've done uh, because I'm working with uh, n equals 3, these are related to Cooperberg spiders. So I've done an orientation where anything going to the right is labeled 2, anything going to the left is labeled 1, and anything labeled 0 or 3 I don't draw. Why don't we draw 0 and 3? Well, wedge 0 of Cn is the trivial, and wedge 3 of Cn is the trivial. So these are corresponding to trivial representations. So in a ladder diagram, all you can do is you can go along and have uh, you can have a sh as you're going along, this guy of thickness two can decide to give one of his strands to his neighbor. So he gave one of his strands, and now he's a one, and this became a two. This two could say, "Well, I'm going to give one strand to my neighbor and go on." Here he decides, "I'm going to give one strand to my neighbor and go on." So you have these strands of various thickness. As they pass along, they can give a strand to one of their neighbors. These are the two things that can happen. So we call these ladder diagrams, because you can kind of climb up these things if you, if you draw that angle sharp enough. Can you comment on the orientation on the arrows? Yeah, so the orientation was meant that anything labeled 2 was supposed to be going uh, this way, mm -hmm. and anything going uh, this way is labeled 1. And so in the, in the middle? Every vertex is either a source or a sink. In the middle, these things are labeled 0 or 3. So again, just to go back, uh, if this power is 0 or n, 
then that's a trivial representation. We don't, it's kind of like the most boring SLN representation. So we don't want to have a picture that represents it. And that's what these ladders are doing. Like, so here, I had one and two combined, and they formed three. Right? When, when one string plus two strings is three, so now this has thickness three, but I don't draw three. So, okay, well that's kind of a weird category to consider. These ladders, like very simple pictures. Strands of various thickness, they can jump off to their neighbors. What's interesting is when I demand that there is a representation of SLM on these pictures. So a weight lambda, remember lambda is like an n minus 1 tuple, lambda 1 up to lambda n minus 1. I map this to this very boring diagram where the, all the strands are straight. And this is a1, ai, an minus 1, am, where lambda i is equal to AI plus 1 minus AI. And how do I pick these? You're thinking, I'm basically, for those that are experts, I'm just switching from GLN weights to SLN weights. Um, I use this because I have an integer N, a capital N, that I know these things sum up to. So the sum of the AIs is equal to N. So you can solve this equation, and that's where we map lambda. Where do we send EI? We send EI to the ladder, which takes AI and moves a strand to his neighbor. Just, just the i strand he gets an extra string. What does f do? He takes a string off of the i plus 1 and moves it down here. So this is how e's and f's are going to act. And again, our rules are that we don't draw lines labeled 0 or n because they correspond to the trivial representations. So now here's where it gets fun. Like That's all we had to know. If you really understood the definition of SLM when I wrote earlier, you can now invent all the diagrammatics of all the link diagrams you know in SLM. Here's an example. Let's consider the representation where the number, where the AI is summed to 2. So my sum of my AIs is just 2, and AIs are between 0 and 2. Okay, well, I have this where one string is labeled 0 and one is labeled 2. I have where one string is labeled 1, the other one's labeled 1, and one where they're labeled 2 and 0. And I've drawn them in their SL2 weights. Because remember, the SL2 weight is B minus A. So this is weight 2, this is weight 0, this is weight minus 2. Now I just demand that this is an SL2 representation. Well, E is the, or F in this case, it's a map from 0, 2 into 1, 1. It's this little ladder. And again, using our rules that we don't draw 0 or 2, I've created just this little ladder. And you know, going from here to here, pictures are read from right to left. It's a little confusing. So going from 1, 1 to 0, 2, I have this little guy. Let's just start imposing SL2 relations. So for example, if I start here and I do EF minus FE, that should be equal to quantum 2. Right? This is doing, well, if I first apply F, that looks like this half of the picture. And then I apply E, it looks like this picture. This one is zero, because if I apply an E to this guy, I fall off the edge. So this is zero. What I've just proven is that this funny looking circle guy is equal to quantum two. And if I do the same thing, do this SL2 relation on this guy, uh, on the zero weight space, do E, F, minus F, E, I just get this weird isotopy looking relation. And if I go and look at what does the quantum vial group action look like on the zero weight space, so remember the quantum vial group action takes you from the zero weight space, or it takes you from the n weight space to the minus n weight space. But if zero, if this guy is in weight 0, then the quantum vial group action is just going to give me a map from him to himself, 0 to 0. Now, this was our big formula. It looks pretty scary, but in any finite dimensional representation, it's a finite sum. So it's actually just these, very, just these two terms, 1 sub 0 and Q, F, E. So do the identity, go over there, and come back with some Qs. So this quantum vial group braiding 
should be equal to this sum. Uh, and if you think about it, these ones are saying the defining representation of SL2, right? Wedge one of C2, that's just C2. So the braiding between the defining representation of SL2 represented in pictures should be given by this formula. And again, this should remind you of So is it axiomatized or is it, does it follow from or is it some of your previous axioms? So what if you, what you do? Yeah, yeah. So this, so this is just saying that the braiding is equal, so like, I've already, like it's a general theory of Lustig that these T's satisfy braid relations. So like, I know those things satisfy braid relations, and uh, on any representation, they're gonna satisfy braid relations. So here's a specific one. So if I, if I know this thing is like a braiding, I've drawn it like this, but it says that this braiding should be represented in this graphical calculus by this formula. I'm, I'm interpreting the braiding as just these quantum group elements. So the braiding has just become this, which if I take these ladder diagrams as a representation, I get exactly this picture. So I've invented the Kaufman bracket by demanding that on a specific choice, you know, I had to be a little careful how I chose this representation, but by choosing a specific representation, I was able to use the quantum vial group action and these ladder diagrams to invent the calculus. So I'm going to stop here. Next time we can do the SL3 one. So if you've never seen Kuperberg spiders for SL3, we'll invent them using only SLN in the next talk. Questions? So will we see uh, will we see those relations for? Uh, Hex, uh, hex, uh, hexagon uh, for quadrilateral reduction. Yep, and everything. Yeah. They all are just SLN relations. Yes. And am I am I right that this SL uh, SL2 uh, theory works for SLN only and doesn't <coughs> work for G2 or C2? Correct. Because this skew how duality, this special representation, it's a very much a type A phenomenon. There's other types of how dualities out there, but this this representation is very special because. <laughs> I mean, the key point was that I could use the SLM braid group. The fact that the vial group for SLM is the symmetric group that deforms to the braid group, that was special already. And then the fact that, the, that these sort of actions commute on this space. I can't get past A, it's only type A. But the beautiful thing here is that I can really do all of type A, including the, oh, I guess I had a picture here. Oh no, this is SL3, we'll do that next time. Uh, and you uh, and, and you will get the clarification. So, so yeah. So here here's the, here's the punchline. Let me like just jump ahead to give you a preview of the next talk. This stuff actually you could invent the temporally leap category, invent all the relations in the temporally leap category, and just by using the quantum group, all the relations in the temporally leap category are images of the quantum group here. When you pass to SLN, this was an open problem. People didn't have a complete graphical description of the representation category. Cooperberg did it for SL3 and Scott Morrison conjectured it for SLN, but it was open problem. Cowder's Kamnitzer and Morrison solved that problem using skew how duality. So using this very duality, they were able to prove that there, here is a finite set of relations for SLN, which generates the, the representation category, these, these types of pictures in the SLN setting. So you will invent what homology next time? Exactly. We're going to invent even Dror's version of Kovanov homology. Because who wants to do, you know, like categorified quantum group representations and blah, blah, blah. That's horrible. What, what's nice is pictures. Like, we will just do exactly the same thing with categorified quantum groups. We'll invent a foam category. It's a slight lie. It's not really drawers category. There's a little bit of funny business that happens there, which I think is quite interesting. It tells you that there's a slightly modified version of the foam category we should be considering. And you can do it for SLN. So those that are experts in link homology, you know that SLN was a big problem to do it in foams because no one knew how to evaluate closed foams. There was no finite set of relation for evaluating SLN foams. This gives them to you. You get a foam category with a finite set of generators and relations all coming from categorified quantum groups. I mean, yes, that, that, <laughs> that quantum vial group action is the braiding. Like, that's the braiding. Uh, oh, wrong way. Um, oh. the, point of, the point of this is that uh, this guy is the braiding. He's the arm matrix. Yeah, but, uh, is it the of the yeah, 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 yeah. 
So this is, I mean, this is due to Tron Rukia, but I mean, look at this guy. He's just dying to be a complex, right? He just wants to be a chain complex, a big chain complex of E's and F's when you categorify them. So we're going to have a big complex. The differentials are going to be given by things in the categorified quantum group. We have this beautiful chain complex. He generates the braiding. It's just a complete beautiful story where we invent all the SLN link homologies using categorified quantum groups. Well, can you invent something new <laughs> which would be yes. stronger than the old stuff? Well, in some sense. I think there were some versions of the SLN theory that were known maybe due to Ben Webster's approach. But basically where this all started was like I, I you know, I obviously love categorified quantum groups, and I wanted to be able to explain to someone very quickly how does categorified quantum groups have anything to do with Coven homology. And the story was so long and so horrible that I couldn't ever convince anyone. But people like Drawer's approach with the pictures and nice, so I needed a way to use them to get that. And uh, what we get is all of these SLN link homology theories, they were unknown before. Also, people didn't know if they were integral, and uh, this result implies integrality, because everything in the categorified quantum group is defined integral. So we prove a lot of theorems in link homology that weren't, that weren't known previously. So it's not just recovering things that other people could do, but it's, it's actually new, new results. So completely technical question, where on the web is this uh, presentation? Uh, I'll put it on my web page after I fix all the typos. Um, yeah, and I can also send like some, some references to papers right here, but if you want this one. The introduction to my SL2 and SL3 paper is essentially this. Uh, this. No, there's always an advantage to seeing the exact thing. Right, right, right. right. So. What is how duality? So how duality is whenever you have uh, two uh, groups acting on the same space where one is the commutant of the other. So if you've ever heard of uh, Schervile duality, this is yes. where this, yeah. So that's an example of a how pair. It's whenever you have two groups acting on the same space where one is the commutant of the other. Like the, the, this guy's action on here, he's the commutant of that. So that's what, that they call it how duality by Roger, Roger Howe invented it. And it's a, there's a whole nice theory developed for when this, when this happens. Right, maybe we can postpone the next questions after the yeah, next talk. <laughs> 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 so Oh, sure, yeah. Sorry. Uh, uh, so, very useful and very useful. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Uh, is this, let's see, oh, it's, it's just, uh, so you guys do spiders for which, uh,